the Ruchim of Ba'im ladies. We are studying today Parashat Toledot. Our parasha is very famous and well known for the Berachot that Yaakov Abinu received from his father. All of us know the story how Yaakov Abinu had to disguise himself like Asav, wearing the hairy clothes, and his father, thinking that he was Asav, gave him the blessings. As a matter of fact, there's something unique about this perasha that if you look in every single aliyah, there's seven olim, there's seven parts. Each perasha is broken up into seven parts. If you ever went to the synagogue on Shabbat, they send up seven people to the Sefer Torah. They always break the perasha into seven parts. If you look in every single part, there's a mention of blessing. In Aliyat Kohen, the Pasuk writes that God tells Yitzhak that he's going to be blessed, or that Abraham Abinu was blessed. Gur azot. God says to Yitzhak, There's blessing. If you look in Aliyat Levi, the Pasuk also says the word blessing. By Barichehu Hashem, that's the way the Aliyah ends. By Barichehu Adonai. If you look in Aliyat Shilishi, the last words over there, it says, Ufarinu Ba'aris. We're going to be prosperous in the land. I mean, I could go through each Aliyah if you have the time and I could show it to you that every Aliyah. This blessing. Vaiki Zaken Yitzhak. Yitzhak gets older. He tells Esav, go out and prepare food for me. Ba'asidi Matami, make for me the delicious foods that I enjoy to eat. Ba'avur te barikhikhan nafshi. So I bless you before I die. That's that Aliyah. You go to the next Aliyah. Which is, of course, the Aliyah of Shishi, which is the blessings. This is the Aliyah that has the actual blessings themselves that Yitzhak Abinu gave to Yaakov. And then Shivi'i is when Isab walks into his father and he says, What happened over here? He says, Oh, your brother came already. Uh, it's too late. You missed out on the Berachot. And Yitzhak Abinu says, Gam Baruch He confirms the blessings. He says, I didn't make a mistake. Gam Baruch Yaakov should be blessed. So you see, Toledot is a very, very special uh, perasha. Incidentally, it is the sixth perasha. The number six usually is connected to blessing. Whenever you see the number six, you know there's beracha not far away. For example, when the Jewish people were in Egypt, so it says there was a tremendous beracha in the fertility. Ubnei Yisrael paru vayishritzu vayirbu vayatzmu bimod meod. The Torah says that they flourish six at a time. The number six is used when they want to talk about beracha, when they want to talk about an abundance. On the days of Sukkot, for example, every day of Sukkot, we commemorate another tzaddik. The first day is Abraham, and then Yitzhak, and then Yaakov, and then Moshe, and then Aharon. And the sixth day is Yosef. Yosef is also represented in blessing. Is number six. Why? Because each tribe counts as one. But Yosef as Sadiq, his tribe counts as two. 
Because he has Menashe and Ephraim. So again, you see the number six is Beracha. Just as a side point, I didn't come to teach you about the number six today. This is just an introduction to show you how significant this Beracha is. If you look at the word Beracha, the, wo- the root of Beracha is Bet, Resh, Chaf, Barich. Why did they choose those three letters for Beracha? Because the Beracha is always more. If somebody has one, you give him two, he has Beracha, he has double. So Bet is double one. That's what they have a bet. Resh, in the digits of a hundred, if somebody has a hundred, what's double of a hundred? Two hundred. That's a resh. And the digits of ten, if I give you ten, double of ten is twenty. That's chaf. So therefore, in the word beracha, you have two, twenty, two hundred, which all is Double in the single digits, double in the digits of ten, and double in the digits of a hundred. That's why they chose those words. By the way, there's also a law that says, in the laws of inheritance, the firstborn also receives a double portion. How do we say firstborn in Hebrew? Bechor. It's the same letters. Bet, Chaf, and Resh. Because he gets double. The bet is double of the single digits, and the chaf is double of the digits of ten, and the resh is double of the digits of a hundred. Bechor and barech are the same letters. Anyway, that's why maybe if you ever went to shul on Shabbat, by us at least, our minhag, the most significant aliyah is aliyah shishi. As you know. Why aliyah shishi? Because the number six is corresponding to Beracha, to a great abundance. In this Beracha, if you count, you'll see the word Beracha, or Ba'abarechecha, or any word connected to those words, Beracha, is written 32 times. That is more than any other Beracha. It's a very big week, the week of the sixth week of the Torah, this is the week of Berachot. It's a good luck for us. It's a good mazal for us whenever we reach Parashat Toledot. You know you're reaching the week of Berachah. Be'azat Hashem, all those that are here and those that are not will be the recipient and the benefactors of this great Berachah. Amen. And now to the subject at hand. How is it possible that Isab is able to manipulate the tzaddik Yitzhak? After all, Yitzhak really thought that Isab was a tzaddik. And that was the furthest thing from the truth. Isab, the Torah says, was a, was a hunter. He was not religious, although he portrayed himself as religious and is pious. But the Gemara compares him to a hazir. You forgive me, but to a pig. Where the pig has one of the two kosher signs. Its hooves are split. That's a kosher sign. But it does not chew its cud. The hazir sticks his paws out and says, look, I'm kosher. Eat me. But he hides his non-kosher sign Inside, this was Isab. He comes to his father like he's a big Sadiq, but he's a Hazir. He shows us his kosher signs. But inside, he is, of course, the most contaminated one. How is it possible that Sadiq Yitzhak can get fooled? I cannot ask you every question that I have on the parasha now. I'm just going to say some questions that should bother all of us. And maybe in the course of the talk, these questions will be answered. 
What is this business that Yitzchak Abinu is eating? He always is telling Isab, prepare for me food. Does the tzaddik really care about meat and a dinner and a, and a, and a, and a lamb chop? The, the tzaddikim, we expect them to be above these material pleasures. Why always, he tells Isab, bring for me something to eat, bring for me some, some food. And anyway, how did he eat from the food of Isab? There's a halakha that if a person is not observant, even though he makes the shi'ita with a good knife, and even though he slaughters it correctly, you're not allowed to eat from such a shi'ita. If you have, let's say, a shuhit that's mahal al-shabbat, but he's a very good shuhit, but he smokes cigarettes on Shabbat, could you eat from such a shi'ita? Of course not. There's qualifications. Isab is not a tzaddik, by no means. Isab is a lumar. The Gemara tells us that at a very young age, Isab already committed many averot. He denied the resurrection of the dead. He committed acts of adultery. He committed acts of murder. He denied even Olam Abba. The eternal existence. Such Averot like this, how could Yitzhak even eat from such food? This is a very, very big question. How do we know that Isab was the murderer? The Torah tells us on a certain day, Yaakov Abinu was making lentil soup. Hades, the lentil. And it says, Isab came home from the field and he was tired. And she says, why was he so tired? Why this day was he more tired than any other day? And she says, because he just came from committing the act of murder. Who did he murder? He murdered Nimrod. I remind you, Nimrod was the one that threw Abraham Abinu in the fiery furnace. Nimrod was the one that helped build the tower of Babel to fight God. Nimrod was the one that used to preach that he's God or that the sun is God. Nimrod was the big Rasha of the generation. And on that day, Esav had killed Nimrod. So he came back from the field. He was weary. He was very, very tired. The Midrash writes, how did he kill Nimrod? You see, Nimrod used to wear a special a coat or a jacket that he got all the way back from Adam Arishon. Remember when Adam Arishon left Gan Eden, God made him a special coat. And the tradition was, whoever wears this coat, you cannot kill him. One day, Isab was shooting arrows in the field, hunting, and the Mrod comes to him and says, hey, this is my territory. This is your territory, what makes it your territory? It's the public domain. It's open season, anybody can go hunting. So, the Mrod said, oh yeah, if you want, we'll make a dukerav. Dukerav is a, a fight. And we'll see who wins. And the winner of the fight, you get the jungle. So, Esav said, you got it. Tomorrow at this time, we come over here, we fight to the end. Yaakov, Esav came home. And Yaakov says, what happened today, Esav, in the field? He said, I met this guy in the road. Tomorrow I have a fight with him. He said, you're crazy. You'll never beat him. He wears the coat of Adam and Ishon. You cannot get him. He says, oh no, what did I do now? So Yaakov is teaching Esav strategy. <laughs> Esav is so smart. But Yaakov is smarter. Yaakov tells him, when you meet him tomorrow, before you fight him, tell Esav, 
tell them, Lord, of course you're going to beat me. You're wearing the coat. There's no Hiddush. Take the coat off and let's fight like real men. And the Mrod is Ga'ava. He's Ge'er. He'll take off the coat. Once he takes off the coat, you grab it and you put it on and you beat him. That's exactly what he did. He comes the next day and the Mrod says, okay, we're ready. He says, oh, of course. You're a cheater. You're wearing the coat. He says, oh, you know about the coat? I don't need the coat. I can beat you with one hand behind my back. He takes off the coat. Isab grabs the coat, puts it on and he kills the Mrod. So he asks Yaakov for some of the lentil soup. Why was he making lentil soup? That why was that the, the soup du jour? That's the soup of the day? So the Gemara says that on that day Abraham Abinu had passed away. And the custom in the olden days as well as today that they used to serve the mourners, lentils. Because lentils is the food of Abelim for two reasons. Number one, the lentil is round. And that consoles the mourners because life is cyclical. People are born, people get old, people pass away. This is the cycle of life. So when we give them round foods, it consoles them that this is this is the way the world is. It's a world of cycles. That's why they also feed the mourners eggs. Because the egg is also round. Maybe you remember a long time ago on the night of Pesach, they gave you an egg to eat. Why? Nobody knows why we eat eggs on Pesach. But we know we have to eat an egg. All the way at the end of the Seder, at the end before the, the meal, they say, everybody take an egg. Why? Because our tradition is that always the night of Pesach is the same night as the Be'av. You'll figure that out. Whatever night Pesach was this year. Anybody remember what night Pesach was this year? The first night of Pesach? It was a Tuesday night? It was a Monday night or it was a Wednesday night? So we said every day of the week so far. Uh, it was a Monday night? It was a Sunday night? Not such a hard question. Well, I know it cannot be on a Sunday night because the Gemara says the first night of Pesach can never come out on a Monday. No, but do Pesach. And I know Pesach cannot come out the first day on a Wednesday either. And I know Pesach cannot come out the first day on a Friday. So we limit it. In any event, Always the first night of Pesach will always be the same night as Tisha B'Av that year. So you see that we want to commemorate that. So how do we commemorate Tisha B'Av on the first night of Pesach? We eat the egg. Oh, the egg reminds us of Avilut, the cycles of life. Another reason why they serve the morn is lentils is because the Gemara says there's no mouth. It's closed. It doesn't have an opening. En lo peh. It doesn't have a mouth. Similarly, the mourner, en lo peh, what is he going to say? He has nothing to say. Akadosh Baruch Hu does his judgments. We cannot question God or have claims. So just like the lentil, en lo peh, so to the mourner, en lo peh, he has no mouth. That's why the first three days the mourners don't even talk. They're quiet. They don't even respond. So they were traditional. Abraham Abinu passed away. Yaakov Abinu is making the, the lentil soup. Now just as a point of information, how old was Yaakov and Esav at this point? So the Torah tells us, وَيِكْدِلُوا Arim. They were Ni'arim. Rashi says they were 13 years old. And they were just by mitzvah. Some say it cannot be 13 years old. It's more like 15 years old. Could be there was a, a typo in the Rashi. Because it's hard to say they were 13. The logic is that they were 15. Should I go through the math for, for a second? To prove it to you that they had to be 15 years old? It's very easy, the math on this. I don't know what's easy anymore here. 
but I'll try it. Abraham Abinu was a hundred years old when he had Yitzhak. Yitzhak was sixty years old when he had his children, Yaakov and Isaac. That means when Yaakov and Isaac were born, Abraham was a hundred and sixty. Abraham lived to 175. So that means on the day that Abraham died, they must have been 15 years old. That's very easy math. So even though that she says 13, could be it really means 15 years old. But they were youngsters. And it says in Rashi, they got to the age of 15. And all of a sudden, each one went on his own path. Isav went on the path of wickedness, of bad. And Yaakov, on that day, turned to the path of goodness. You want me to read you the words of the Rashi? That wouldn't hurt any of us. Let's see exactly the words of the Rashi. Thirteen or fifteen, like I said. Something happened on their fifteenth birthday, where all of a sudden. Until that point, Rashi comments, You really couldn't see such a difference between the two. But at that age, all of a sudden it was, they split. Esav went to the left, and Yaakov went to the right, and they would remain on that path to the end of their life. What happened on that day exactly? This was a turning point. In order to understand all these questions that I told you, I need to tell you a story that happened in the times of the Prophet. There was a Prophet called Elisha. Elisha Navi was a student of Eliyahu Navi. Eliyahu Navi was his rabbi. And he served him for many years. He was a loyal student. Before Eliyahu and Avi died, Elisha came to his rabbi and said, Please bless me. I want to be twice as great as you were. <laughs> this is, uh, uh, have to have guts to ask for such a benacha. I want to be double. He didn't ask, I want to be like you. I want to be twice as great as you. Eliyahu Nabi's answer is even more shocking. Eliyahu Nabi says, fine. If you will be by me at the time of my death, you will be next to me at the time that I go up, you will be double. If not, then you remain who you are. That means... And the Awad Abid didn't answer him back. What are you talking about? I would have answered that. If I have a hundred, how can I give you two hundred? I can only give you as much as I have. So you cannot ask somebody that has a hundred dollars in his pocket, please give me two hundred. This is not in my capacity. But the Awad Abid doesn't say that. And the Awad Abid says, I'll give you the double. You got it. If you're next to me at the time of the death, it's yours. And it happened. Elisha was there when Eliyahu Nabi went up to the heavens. He died a very unconventional death, Eliyahu Nabi. There was like a fire, and Eliyahu Nabi went into the fire, and Elisha was watching it, and he just went all the way up to the heavens. He really didn't die. He just like went on an elevator. And guess what happened? Elisha would become twice as great as Eliyahu Nabi. Eliyahu Nabi did five miracles in his life, and Elisha would do ten miracles. 
Double. It works. What is this? What is this story? How did this work? Yeah, but how does it work? Yeah, for sure. He, don't be shy. Ask. Ask for a lot. But we have to know how it works. How could you be greater than the person who's giving you the beracha? So I want to give you a big secret today. This is the secret that I came to share with you today. Moshe Rabbeinu lived 120 years. On the day that he died, he says, Ben me'av ve'asrim shana anuchi ayom. Today, I am 120 years old. The simple interpretation is, he was 100, it was his birthday. He was born on Zayin Adar. He died on Zayin Adar. Perfect 120 years. Today, today, this day, Zayin Adar, happy birthday. I am 120 years old. But the Sfarim HaKidoshim say a deep concept. The Zohar HaKadosh writes, every day, when a person wakes up, HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends down a new day to the person. It's a special day. And it's a clean day. It's like a white piece of paper. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, here's the day. It's your day today. And then we go through the hours of the day and we write the history of that day. Whatever good deeds we do is written on the day. Whatever bad deeds, God forbid, is written on the day. It's only one day at a time. God forbid if we do something wrong on that day, one should try to make Teshuvah on that day itself. Because once you give back the day, when you go to sleep, that's it, it goes into the fire. It's very hard to get it out of the file, once it's in the file. But as long as you're holding it, you can erase it. That's why the Harachas says, before you go to sleep at night, Hatati Amiti Pashati, you make vidui. Because you're holding the paper. So you can just cross out and make corrections. And then they take the day, they put it in a box. You wake up the next morning, whoosh, they give you another slice, fresh. There's a new day. What about yesterday? No, yesterday's in the bank already. This is a new day. It's good to know that. Because even if you made a mistake on Sunday, Monday is not related to Sunday. Monday is a new paper. They don't give you the same dirty paper that they gave you. Every single day has its own calling. So I can be good on Monday, and I can be better on Tuesday, and I can even be better on Wednesday. One day has nothing to do with the other. Of course you can have momentum, but you understand my point. But every day you're living as one day. Except on the day of death. The Zohar Kadosh says on the day of death, all the days come together. Now you have not one day, but you have 120 years of days that are all coming at the same moment. Now, could you imagine if you were a tzaddik, on the day of the death, the Kiddushah of the tzaddik is that much greater. Because he's not living one day now. He's living all his days. That means all the zechuyot come. And all the good deeds that he did. And all the accomplishments. They all come like a volcano. And it's erupting with Kiddushah at that moment of death. Moshe Rabbeinu said before he died, Ben me'ave asim shana anukheyom. Today I'm 120 years. That means all of my accomplishments that I did in the 120 years are with me today. This is a special day. That's why it says, "Vezot haberacha asher berach Moshe isha Elohim et bnei Yisrael lefnei Moto." On that day, he blessed the Jewish people because that day that he died, there's no greater day that he could bless Am Yisrael. On that day, the Torah for the first time refers to Moshe Rabbeinu as isha Elohim. Until that moment, Moshe is called Ish. He's a man. On the day of his death. He's called the godly man. And the Gemara says, on the day of his death, from his waist and up, he was godly. From his waist down, he was man, he was Ish. Ish Elohim, half man, half angel. 
But they never called him that before the last day of his life. Because on that day, he had the, the compound uh, uh, power of all his days. Shall I give you another example of who this happened to? Abraham Abinu. It says, Abraham Zakin. Baba Yanin. And Abraham was old. He came with his days. What do you mean he came with his days? The explanation is that on the day of his death, he came with every single day. He came with a big notebook. All the pages of his life were all with him in his hand. Baba Yamin. If you ask a tzaddik on any given day, show me your paper. He shows you one paper. This is today. Where's yesterday's paper? Uh, that's in the Shemaim. That's in the bank already. I can show you what I did today. On the day of death, Abraham Abinu could show the whole life here. It's all in front of him. And therefore the Kiddushah is compounded. That means at the moment of death, the Tzaddik is not the same Tzaddik. At that moment, he's getting everything in one shot. Where everything until that point was separate. This is a deep concept that I'm telling you. And this happens right at the moment of death. Ah, we go slow. <laughs> Eliyahu and Nabi told Elisha, you want to become double? You can become double. Now I cannot give you a double butt. But if you're with me at the time of my death, when all my days come to me, at that moment there's a tremendous burst of Kiddushah. There's a tremendous... Uh, Shefa, there's a tremendous influence of holiness, and if you're there, you could, you could take, you could take much more than I was able to take, because the tzaddik only gets it when he's leaving the world, but whoever's there at the time of death can take all that kedusha and continue. That's the big yesod, the big principle that the svarim kedushim say. There was a great rabbi. Called Hatam Sofer. Hatam Sofer gave a eulogy on his rabbi. His rabbi was called Rabbi Natan Adler. Rabbi Natan Adler was a Gaon Olam. The Hatam Sofer used to call his rabbi Haneshira Gadol, the great eagle. Because in Yiddish, Adler is an eagle. We say, Hanesher Agadol, the great eagle. He once said, Hatam Sofer, about his rabbi. He said, I know that the rabbis of the Tosafot, that's the commentary on the Talmud, I know that Benu Tam, Benu Tam is a great rabbi of Tosafot, of the, of the Talmud commentary. He says, I know that Benu Tam had to be greater than my rabbi. Because Benu Tam was a thousand years ago. He said, but I don't see how he could be greater than my rabbi. I know he has to be greater, but I don't know how he can be greater. I mean, I don't know everything. He said at the eulogy, I regret that I wasn't there at his bedside when he passed away. Because if I would have been at his bedside when he passed away, I could have been double of what I am today. So he believed it. This is something that the tzaddikim understood. Keep this concept in your mind. It's an important concept. I want to tell you another concept today. This concept is on my mind because we were learning it in the Gemara the other day, the Data Yomi. There was a great rabbi called the Yoshua ben Hananiah. The Yoshua ben Hananiah was known that whenever the Goyim, the philosophers, wanted to debate against the Jewish people. The rabbis would always tell the Be Yeshua, you go represent us. And whatever philosophical questions the Goyim would ask us, the Be Yeshua would answer. He always had the right answer, and they were wise guys. They questioned, who says you're the chosen people? 
Who says that a God cares about the Jews anymore? Why are you so punished more than any nation? They would ask strong questions about the Jews. And the Bi Yoshua, tick, tick, tick. This week we learned in Dafa Yumi that he once had a uh, debate with the scholars from Athens. They call them Hachme Atuna. Atuna is Athens. They had 60 scholars. And Rabbi Yoshua went into the Colosseum over there in Athens. They said, who are you? Rabbi Yoshua. What do you want? I came to learn from you wisdom. He said, learn from, learn from us wisdom? Okay. And they started to go back and forth. And they asked him 12 questions. And he answered every one of the 12 questions. And they lost the bet, because he made a bet with them, and they lost the bet. Look over there in the Gemara, it tells you what they had to do when they lost the bet. But it was known for this. When the Yeshua got old, he was about to die, the students came to him and said, Rabbeinu, ma teheve alan me'apikosim. What's going to be with the Apikosim now? What's going to be with all these wise guys? You're not going to be around to answer them anymore. When you were alive, we know we could call Rabbi Yoshua, you answer. But once you leave the world, who's going to be the, the one that goes to these debates? We don't have anybody that has your wisdom. Rabbi Yoshua said, you have nothing to worry about. God creates the world always in a balance. As long as I'm here, the Apikursim are very smart also. Once I leave the world, they also leave the world. God always keeps everything fair. So, the reason why the Apikursim have such a good question is because I'm in the world and have such a good answer. Once God takes me, God will take them also. Don't worry. They're not going to ask such good questions when I pass away. When I pass away, they'll ask questions that you can answer. That means, when the Kawah of Kiddushah goes down, the Kawah of Tum'ah goes down also. So everything is always balanced. It wouldn't be fair otherwise. But the Kiddushah leaves and Tum'ah stays over here. It's not fair. So, Buddha Allah says, when the Kiddushah goes, the Tum'ah goes. If I were to ask you ladies, who is the biggest Sadiq of the generation in the times that we're talking now? Well, it's clear it was Abraham Abinu. Abraham was 175 years old. I know Yitzhak was alive, and I know Yaakov was alive. Yaakov was only 15 years old. Yitzhak, of course, was a great Sadiq, but Abraham is his father. Abraham was Gadol Ador. He was the man that promoted monotheism. He's the one that promoted all the uh, belief in God throughout the world. He was the bastion of Hesed. Abraham Abinu was the great Sadiq of the generation. And Abraham Abinu dies. Who would you say is the counter of Abraham? Who's the anti Abraham? Nimrod. Of course. Nimrod is the number one enemy of Abraham. Whatever Abraham was teaching, Nimrod was teaching the opposite. Abraham teaches God, Nimrod says, I'm God. Abraham teaches Chesed, Nimrod takes Abraham and throws him into a fire. They lived in the world together. What did I teach you a couple of minutes ago? Ah, very good. Remember Isab, I told you, was in the field? And he came home tired. Why was he tired, I told you? Because he killed the Mirod. When he came home, what did he see? His brother's making lentil soup. He says, Yaakov, who died? Grandpa Abraham died. On the same day as the Mirod. You see, Zeda Umad Zeh. Always when the Kiddushah goes away, so the Tum'ah also dissipates. But wait. When Abraham was on his deathbed, what came to Abraham all his days? The Abraham Zakin Baba Yameen. Who was by his bedside when he passed away? Yaakov Abinu. 
At the young age of 15 years old, he was there when his grandfather returned his soul. And all the Kiddushah of Abraham Abinu, since he was there at the time of death, it was like Elisha with Eliyahu Hanavi. All that Kiddushah of 175 years, Yaakov Abinu was able to, to draw from it. He was in the right place at the right time. That's what Rashi means. That on that day, it was a big day. At his 15th birthday, I asked you, what happened on the 15th birthday? That it says, oh, Yaakov started to go on the great path of life. Because it was that day that he was by his grandfather when he passed away. And what happened to Esav on that day? He was also by the bedside of somebody that died. He was by the bedside of Nimrod. Could you imagine the Tum'ah that came down into the world at the death of Nimrod? Very good. On that day when he killed Nimrod, all the years of Apikursut, of denying God, all the years of cruelty, all the years of defiance, all the years of rebellion, rebelliousness, all that came down. Could you imagine all the Malachi Habala, all the angels of destruction that came down at that time to punish Nimrod, all the Gehinnam, all the Kilipot, all the, all the troubles, all the evil that came down. And who's standing there absorbing all of it? <laughs> Esav. <laughs> Don't get fooled by me, as if I know what I'm saying over here. <laughs> No, don't give me more credit than I deserve. <laughs> this is what I'm saying. I understand it as much as I'm saying it. I don't know any more than what I'm saying. How it works? Is it is it wireless? Is it uh, is it transferred through uh, through uh, radar? I'm not sure exactly. You know what, ladies? I, I don't claim that I'm the smartest one in the room. After the class, you go ask your local uh, Orthodox rabbi who knows a little more on this subject, and they'll explain it. This is as much as my rabbis taught me. So I cannot say more. I don't want to say things that I'm not allowed to say. But all I know is what, what I heard from my rabbis. That Yaakov was in the right place at the right time, and Esau was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and therefore something very critical happened on that day. Yes, yes, no, no, by their own choice. Yeah, I would assume that Yaakov wanted to be by his grandfather because he appreciated it. And it's fair to assume that Esav did not mind to be by Nimrod because uh, he had a, a connection to that type of uh, uh, life, whatever you say. That's fine. Now wait, wait. I'll answer you. Without the shem, I'll answer you. Maybe what I'll say will answer the questions. <laughs> Esav comes home that day. He says, give me some soup. I'm tired. So what does Yaakov Abinu say? Mikhra chayom. Sell me your birthright like today. What do you mean like today? He should say mikhra hayom. Sell me today. I don't say, sell me your birthright like today. Like today. There's nothing like today. Sell me it today. What does it mean, Mikhra Chayom? Yaakov Abinu says, Esav, we both know what happened today. I was by my grandfather with the Kiddushah. This is my calling. I'm into the Kiddushah, into godliness, into spirituality. And we know where you just came from. You're next to Nimrod with the Tum'ah, this is your connection. Therefore, what do you want to be Chorah for? The birthright is a religious document. The birthright means you serve and bring sacrifices and you have to be designated for God. This is not your... The events of today prove that you are not suitable for the Bechorah. So therefore, Yaakov says, Mechra Chayom. Sell it to me based on what happened today, like today, look at the current events. Isn't it obvious that you are not suitable for the... And Esav says, you're right. 
Who needs it? This is a religious document. I'm not interested in the religious document. He had all the Tum'ah in him. Therefore, he had no understanding of it. But I'll tell you another interpretation. You see the word Hayyum? The Tzaddik interprets the word Hayyum one way. And the Rasha interprets the word Hayyum another way. Ask a Tzaddik. When you hear the word Hayyum, what does Hayyum mean? Oh, Hayyum. Asher Anuchim Etzabecha, Hayyum. You must do the mitzvot today. Hayyum Na'asotam Umahal Lekabel Secharam. Do the mitzvot today and you'll get the reward tomorrow. The Tzaddik always understands reward is later. This is the world of Asiyah, the world of action. Ask a Rasha, what does the word Hayyum mean? You know what the Rasha says? Eat and be merry today, for tomorrow you shall die. Like the Nabi said, Echol v'shato hayom ki maham namut. They both have the same word. The Rasha says, I live for today. You cannot eat steak after you die. You cannot drink uh, uh, whiskey after you die. You cannot enjoy all the pleasures of life. There was a, a plane that was in emergency. The plane was, uh, the pilot said, everybody has to go into emergency crash position. Sakana. The guy is pushing the button for the stewardess. Sakana. The guy next to him says, what do you you want a stewardess now? She cannot help you. The whole plane is is going down. He says, I want a whiskey. He says, now you want a whiskey? He says, this is going to be my last whiskey before I die. In a few minutes, I cannot have any more whiskey. I need one more drink before. That's the people. They say, live and be merry today. Because in the grave, there's no parties. So you see the difference? The tzaddik, here's the word hayyom. He says, oh, hayyom na'asotam. Today we have to do the good deeds. Tomorrow we'll get the reward. The rasha says, today, today we have to have a party because there's nothing tomorrow. So Yaakov Abinu tells Esam, Esam, my dear brother, we know we have two different dictionaries. My dictionary, Hayom, has one interpretation. Your dictionary, Hayom, has another interpretation. So, Mishra, sell me the birthright, Kayom, like your interpretation of Hayom. You interpret, be merry today and tomorrow you shall die. You don't want this religious document. Take the lentil soup, enjoy it. I'll give you a bottle of wine with it. It comes with a loaf of bread as well. Eat yourself happily and go enjoy yourself. The way I understand Hayom, oh, I understand Hayom differently. I understand today you must be good and tomorrow there's reward in Allah Mabba, but you don't believe in that stuff. So, Mikhra Hayom, sell me the birthright based on your interpretation like you interpret the day. There's one more point that I have to explain to you and then I can uh, dismiss you. You do get extra credit for coming on a legal holiday, ladies. It's, it's noticed. God bless you. Amen. The, the question is the food. What does the food have to do with all this here? So Yitzhak is eating food all the time? He keeps on telling Esau, bring me food, bring me uh, uh, more meat. Uh, it's hard to explain that Yitzhak Abinu would have any connection to the physical pleasures of food. There was a great rabbi called Yismach Moshe. Yismach Moshe, one time his wife had to go out to a wedding or something. So she told the rabbi, her husband, I left the pot of food on the fire. Do you mind making for yourself the dinner? He said, no, I, why should I mind? She went. Next to the food, there was another pot filled with soap and uh, water. She was cleaning the pot, leaving the soap in there so to make it easy to... So the Yismah Moshe went. He doesn't know. He takes the soap, he waters, and he's eating it. He's having uh, soup made out of soap, he's eating it, he's eating it. And he didn't know anything. His wife came home, 
says, did you have uh, the dinner? I said, I had it. It was very good. It was very good. So okay. Then she goes to look at the, at the, the stove. She sees he ate the soap. He didn't eat the dinner. And these they smack Moshe, they don't even know what they're eating. They said, they haven't ate it. They're not thinking about the food. They're not thinking about the taste of the food. They have no idea. Their mind is in the Shamayim. Now, if the Ismaq Moshe doesn't think about food, you think it's Hagabin who thinks about food? Of course not. They had Kabanot. The Tzaddik, when you put in front of him food, he's able to taste the Kiddushah that's in the food. There's Kiddushah in the food. This is true. There's tremendous Kiddushah in the food. When a lady makes food for Shabbat, so she's putting kabanot in the food. The tzaddik, when you bring him the food of Shabbat, he can taste the Shabbat. He tastes the holiness in the food. We're tasting the salt and the pepper. It needs more this, needs more that. The tzaddik is able to taste the kabanot that are in the food. For example, the matzah. The holiest food that we have in our religion is the matzah. That's for sure. Because it's one of the only foods that we have to make with kavana. When they cut the wheat in the fields, the rabbi says, L'shem ha'atzat mitzvah, that they cut with kavana. When you make bread, they don't cut the wheat with kavana. You need a rabbi in the field with a long beard and a big hat, he's cutting the wheat for the matzah. Then he brings it to the factory. They grind it. L'shem matzat mitzvah. And then they knead it. L'shem matzah. Then they put it in the oven. Every second. Kavana, kavana, kavana. So when you eat the matzah on Pesach, oh, oh, this is the bread of faith, the Zohar HaKadosh calls. Because there's so much kavanot. But you can't eat emunah. Where are you going to eat emunah? You can't put emunah in your mouth. It's abstract. <clears throat> so you put the emunah in a, in a matzah. So you're eating the matzah, but you're eating what's inside the matzah. The same thing with the korbanot that you see in the olden days. It says, somebody made a sin. He brings a korban, a sacrifice to God. The Kohen slaughters it, sprinkles the blood, <coughs> takes the piece of meat, puts it on the mezbayah, barbecues it, and he eats it. And when the Kohen eats it, the owner gets forgiven. What kind of religion? <laughs> he, eats a piece of, he eats a steak sandwich, the Kohen, and the owner goes away with kapara. Because when the Kohen would eat it, he's eating with the kabanot. You're not eating it with, with, with lust and pleasure. That's the way the tzaddikim are able to, to eat. I'm going to say a chadush that I heard from the rabbis. Do you think for a second, <laughs> if Esav would bring food to Yaakov Avinu, do you think for a second, I'm sorry, if he would bring the food to Yitzhak, you think for a second Yitzhak wouldn't notice what type of food this is? He would right away know that this is not kosher. He would right away sense it. The tzaddikim, Bore Olam, would never bring a stumbling block in front of a tzaddik. The animals of the tzaddikim never ate something that's not kosher. There was a rabbi called the Bipirhas. Bipirhas bin Yair, he had a donkey. He once sold this donkey to a goy. The goy had some fruit. The donkey doesn't want to eat. He doesn't understand it. He's making a ta'anit. He puts the food in front of him, doesn't want to eat. He goes back to the Bipirhas. The donkey doesn't want to eat. He says, did you take turumot and ma'asrot from the fruit? You have to give the kohen something. You have to... He says, I don't have to give anything. He says, yeah, the rabbi said you have to do that. My, my donkey is very mahmir. He's very religious. He doesn't eat foods that are questionable. The rabbis say, if the donkeys of the rabbis are careful on kashrut, could you imagine the tzaddikim themselves? So there's no way Yitzhak Aminu ever ate from the food of, 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 of Yitzhak, of, of Isad. Impossible. He would bring it in, right away Yitzhak would say, you know, the, if you have a minute, I'll tell you one story. There was a rabbi called the Admor from Slavon. He was a big tzaddik. He once was an Edith Israel, this Admor. And he was there with his students. And there was one student over there, uh, Hasid, but from Israel. He doesn't have a beard, like me. Over there by the Hasidim, the beard is very, very, very special. They will have to have beards. He was Hasid, but he doesn't have a beard. 
So, the rabbi of Shlonim says, tomorrow night we're eating by this guy over here. Let's say his name is Yaakov. We're eating by Yaakov's house. He was shocked. He picked me out of all the, the beards over here. He picked me. But Hazid, this guy was a miskin. He was a poor man. He said, how is he going to make us without for the Rebbe? So he, he went to his neighbors. He said, please, I don't have anything. Please help me make the food. Help me get the, the plates and everything. So he had neighbors. They helped him. That night of the Sauda, the Rebbe comes in. He's sitting there. They present him the fish. That's what the Hasidim eat first. They eat the fish. He brings them a plate of the fish. And the Rebbe saying, the Vre Torah, and Zushim, and others, this. And he doesn't eat from the fish. So he tells the, the host, he says, the guy without the beard, he tells him, you have a, a big plate for me? Because the custom of the Hasidim is, oh, bring me plates. I cut from my fish and I give to everybody to eat. The Shirayim. So I need a stack of plates. So the guy without the beard turns to the guy, the next Hasid, his neighbor, with the beard. He goes like this. He opens, he opens his hand. So the rabbi says, what, what are you looking at him for? He says, what should I tell you, rabbi? Uh, you, you asked me to make a sauda. I don't even have enough plates for my own family. So he, he lent me the plates. I got the plates from him. So I'm asking, maybe he has more plates. I don't have plates. So the Rebbe says, ah, you got the plates from him? He tells the guy with the beard, this plate is dipped in the mikveh? He says, no, I didn't dip it in the mikveh. Because there's some opinions say you don't have to... He says, ah, there's some opinions, sir. So the Rebbe says, you know what the difference between you without the beard and you with the beard? You're both going to go up to the Shamayim. To you they're going to say, Jew, where is your beard? But to you they're going to say, Beard, where is your Jew? But you see over here, the rabbi of Slanam knew that the, the plate wasn't dipped in the Megvet. How did he know? He knew. He felt it right away. He said, I cannot keep the fish. This is not dipped in the Megvet. Now you're telling me, if the Admor from Slanum knew that the plate wasn't dipped in the mikveh, you think you could fool Yaakov Abi Yitzhak Abinu? You think you could bring the piece of meat from Isab and put it in front of Yitzhak and he's going to eat it without questions? Of course not. There's great Siddiqim in Israel that I saw. They brought in front of them forks and spoons. Cutlery. Some of them were dipped in the mikveh and some of them were not. The boys, they put a siman, they put a sign. They knew which ones were dipped, which ones were not. They go to the rabbi. The rabbi says, this one is dipped. This one is not. This one is dipped. This one is not. The tzaddikim, they sense the kiddushah. They, they feel it. There's hundreds of stories of tzaddikim that for some reason they said, no, I'm not interested in eating it. Uh, I don't want to eat it. And then they find out later that it wasn't kasher. So what do you think? You think your is going to eat it? So you know what, what I heard once? For all those years, Yaakov Abinu told his brother, let me make the food for daddy. You, you're interested in making food? You want to go hunt? Let me prepare, because he wants to save his father from the problems. So ya- Yaakov would prepare the food, and then Asab would come in and serve it. So Yitzhak Abinu sees the food. Ah, what kedusha! He feels the Kiddushah with Kavanot. When he's eating the food, he's eating the Kiddushah like Matzah. So he's thinking to himself, Yitzhak. But I don't understand. Esav, he's in the field hunting all day long. He's a bum. How does he have such Kiddushah in the food? Ah, you know, Yitzhak said, it must be Esav. is a hidden Sadiq. He's one of the Lamed Bab Sadiqin. You have those guys. Where they're hidden. Yesterday we said in the Shi'ud about the hidden Sadiqim we talked about. You have a Sadiq, they call him the Sandlad. He was a shoemaker. He just sits in there, he makes shoes in the Mushalayim. Someone went to the Hazonish. Hazonish says, What are you coming to me for? Go to the shoemaker. What shoemaker? 
This guy's a shoemaker, he's a big tzaddik, a hidden tzaddik. They go to the shoemaker, give me beracha, what do you mean? I don't know nothing, I have no berachot. There's certain tzaddikim that they act in a regular way. The Baal Shem Tov used to drive the bus. He used to be the bus driver. They said, oh, who's this guy? And then he became the Baal Shem Tov. He revealed himself. Sometimes the tzaddikim, they, they hide. One time there was a, a, a Rasha. He made himself like he was a hidden tzaddik. But the rabbi said, only problem is, he's hidden from himself also. <laughs> he's so hidden, he doesn't even know he's a tzaddik. Anyway, so every day, Yitzhak would eat from the food, thinking it's Esav, but it's not, it's Yaakov's food, from the most kosher kitchen. But on that day, Yaakov tells Esav, Yitzhak tells Esav, go make for me food. Rivka tells Yaakov, Go make for your father food also. On this day, he had to listen to his mother. He had no choice. So he brings in the food, and it says, what came in with the food? The smell of Gan Eden. Like every day. You get all the blessings. Now comes an after, for the first time, all of a sudden, Isaac brought his food. The Midrash says, he couldn't find any animals. There were no animals there. So he brought his father a dead dog. He brought it in, into, the, into the father's house. Brought it. What came in? The smell of Gehinam. For the first time, Yaakov, Yitzhak realized, what's going on over here? And then all of a sudden it became obvious to him that Esav is no hidden Sadiq. Esav is really Rasha. And all those years he was getting the food from Yaakov. The food was the barometer. The food, not that he cared about the food. The food was the way he would test if the person was Sadiq or not. If he felt the Kedusha. After that, he told Isaac, now I see what you are. You're worthless. All these years you tricked me. The Beracha belongs to Yaakov. And you see over here, the Tzaddikim, the Chabot Shabbat. I'll leave you with one last story of one of the Tzaddikim. One of the Hasidim came to the Rabbi's house. I forget the Rabbi's name. One of the old time Rabbi's. He ate from the chulin. You know what chulin is? Hamin. Hamin. Ashkenazim call it chulin. And uh, he's eating from it. He says, what a, what a delicious hamin. He never tasted chulin like this before. So he had the guts to go to the Rebetzin. He said, Rebetzin, please forgive me. This was the best chulin I ever ate. Can I have the recipe for my wife? Of course. A, B, C, D, E. He gives to his wife. His wife makes it. He eats it. Nothing special. It's like every other housewife. It tastes normal. Nothing. So, the Hasid says, the Rebetzin didn't tell me the secret ingredient. There's a secret ingredient that she didn't tell me. When I go back to that town, I'm going to ask her. So he went back to the town. He says, Rebetzin, forgive me. You told me the ingredients, but there's something missing. She says, you're right, there's something missing. And I didn't tell you. There's every Friday, the rabbi, the big Sadiq, he comes into the kitchen and he takes the beans of the hameen and he pours it in the pot and he says, Lechbod Shabbat Kodesh. That you don't have. <laughs> That's the special kavanot. That's why the food of the Sadiqim is different. Because they have... All these things in mind. And that explains us a little of the depth of the episode of Yaakov and Isab and the Berachot. The sixth parasha, the sixth parasha is destined for blessings. And Be'azat Hashem should be fulfilled on us. All the Berachot of the parasha as well. Amen.